Hey everyone, so uh, yesterday I visited three hospitals. Two of those I visited as a specialist, as a professional, but one of those I visited as a patient recovering from COVID-19. So I had a lovely general practitioner and she helped me a lot, but basically I spent more than a half of the visit speaking about how, I f how I'm feeling and how I felt within the last two months. Basically remembering the whole you know, diary in my brain of, you know, of all of the roller coaster I've had. So let's imagine how my day would look like a little bit differently with the help of technologies. So I would wake up and while making my morning coffee, I will be talking with my voice assistant at home with a Google Voice, Alexa, Siri, Cortana, whatever, and she'll be asking me, how do I feel, how I slept? Would I have any, any conditions or symptoms that my GP should be aware of? While going back, uh, while going to the hospital, I would you know, put on my jacket, and by putting on my jacket, on top of my sweater actually, <laughs> Putting on my jacket, I can tap that I use the medication by just tapping on the sleeve, and the jacket can pass information to, to the mobile app. When visiting to the hospital, actually, and going outside, I would have a chatbot or a digital survey about my received experience and how I do I feel after the visit. So my name is Emil Sundjakov. I'm a computer scientist by education, and thanks a lot. And I will be, I'm a computer scientist by education, and I'm using my skills towards problem solving in healthcare. And during my presentation, I'll be talking about connecting the dots, and I will try to, not persuade, but tell you more about how and why I perceive digital technologies as a 21st century screwdriver, a thanks to fix stuff and help stuff in healthcare. So healthcare is a marvelous industry. I love it, truly, and for sure it's important. I, I think we will all will agree that healthcare is an important field that we should all contribute to. But it also is a very challenging field. And throughout the jungle of different challenges, one of the, I wanted to outline only three of those that we'll be focusing during the presentation. The first one is lack of data that we'll be speaking about later on. So I just describe to you the thing about, you know, telling everything about how I felt within the two months to my GP and spending half of the visit to do so. So, and imagine this subjective data I might forget, forget something, I might basically you know, not respond to something if, I don't know, uh, the GP is asking about my lifestyle or any other things. So basically this is a black box, we'll be touch basing in the next slides. The second one, and I will leave it as a dessert to the second half of presentation, is oversaturation with data. So how can we navigate within the ocean and the tides of different data points to actually make sense out of this data we collect? And the third one is how we can use the solutions, the day-to-day -day solutions to actually engage people in their own healthcare services provision. Because uh, my point is that healthcare services is not only the passive engagement when there is a specialist and we're just sitting down, exhaling and saying, do whatever it's needed, I'm here to receive. It's about the dialogue and we can actually support this dialogue through data, so-called data-driven dialogue. I'll be touch base in the, uh, on this uh, in the later slides. And uh, for sure, if we look at the patients, there is a patient journey, so we are wanderers. And for sure, hand in hand with our healthcare professionals or also researchers coming from academics and industry side, we go, it's actually not a straight line how it's on the slide, it's a roller coaster. So it's basically a lot of ups and downs. And I think you all have experienced on your own some of the you know, healthcare services and some of the journeys you've been with during the same pandemic or any other conditions you might have. But basically, if we are about to structure this, and as a computer scientist, for me, it's easier to structure stuff, we have major stops there, starting from a prevention and screening, where we have a broader population not attending the hospital, living outside of the hospital, and how we can identify certain risk factors personalized both the communication as well as the call to action to prevent the disease and the prevalence. Going further to diagnostics and personalizing the diagnostics towards treatment and treatment monitoring both at home as well as the at hospital, as well as the rehabilitation in any other services. And for sure, since we're speaking about tech, we'll be speaking about whether technologies and whether tech can be so-called 21st century screwdriver. But actually the question is why I'm so obsessed about computer science and computers. Why computers? 
And there are many answers to that, but some of the factors why we speak about computers is a broad, an enormously broad amount of applications. Talis was speaking about day-to-day -day, day -day examples, how we can apply tech within you know, bushfires, space tech, environmentalism, but we'll be speaking about healthcare today. And for sure, one of the factors is the size. So we went from a big computers, actually still stayed there, for the industrial applications, lab applications, any others, towards the smaller ones. So what is the smallest computer you've ever seen or held in your hands? A phone, a wearable device, am I right? So we went to a smaller device, a smaller device that was inserted in my jacket, something like this, and even smaller ones like this. So what we see on, a, on this one cent coin is a concept developed in the Michigan Institute of Technology called Smart Dust basically aiming to develop a one cubic millimeter size computer that can actually sense, it has sensor on top of that, that can send data to the server or to the another node with the radio, and it has a small, small solar panel, so it can leave it on its own, and we can deploy it in this room or any other places, whatsoever. Another application for sure, the way how we communicate with computers, and it's the language the same way we use English, we use algorithms, we use math instructions, and we went from, a, and still are there in some application, from very low level or math instruction and abstractions towards a very high level ways how we communicate with computers, so we can give an ability to build to anyone in this room and beyond. And there's an example here, most of you have heard about this on, or tried, it's MIT framework called Scratch, an open source framework with a blockly type of programming, basically building blocks to make the cat dance, sing, run, jump, whatever he, you would like to do him. But we can apply the same blockly programming type of um, communication to actually program sensors and Internet of Things solutions to help us in, uh, in industrial applications as well. And another enormous thing that we'll touch base in throughout the ex examples is the ability to sense. The same way we see here the mole who is blind, he has its nose with the testicles, to navigate throughout the world to do whatever he needs, the same thing we gave to computers through sensors and ability to feel. And throughout the broad application, as I mentioned before, in various industries and day-to-day -day activities, for sure healthcare is what interested our, us during this presentation. And I'm as a computer scientist, I look at myself, and you can look at yourself now as, a, as well, I do see not only the complex biological system, but a, a source of enormous amount and types of data. And we should work with data. Why don't we do this? And uh, we touch base the first example of the black box, so basically lack of data. So let's try and use the tech to actually open up and act base the data inside. And uh, how we can do this, actually, it's not only the rocket science, it's actually day-to-day -day applications that we can utilize to start opening these black boxes throughout the whole patient journey. One of the examples is using wearables. How many of you do have a um, wearable device, smartwatch or smart rank, whatever it is? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of hands there. Also, might assume some people online can raise their hands as well. But basically, it's not only to communicate or to be notified that, hey, I actually missed you know, my, my lecture today and the Siri responded well. It's actually to how can we apply this towards managing pandemics as the World Economic Forum reports. In Harvard uh, University, together with researchers from uh, Stanford and other institutions, actually utilize the power of smartwatches with the optical sensors, movement sensors, guide sensors, uh, temperature sensors, smart rings like Aura Ring as an example, to see the changes, the small changes in, in, your, in your paradigm of movements, temperature sensing, et cetera, to actually state that, hey, this person is of risk of pandemic. And it's not only about the one person. If we extrapolate this layer above, we can see that the small dot of you know, a person who might get infected, we can model how the infection and pandemic can, can be moving throughout the city, throughout the country, throughout the region. And for sure, as I was touch basing about this microscopical approach, one example that uh, actually touched my heart, also in a, in a direct manner, is a project called Cardiogram. University of South California designed a solution uh, that I am also using it right now, so I can get some trends based on my demographics, uh, how my heart behaves using the optical sensor and movement sensors. But it's not only about me, 
is actually I'm sharing this data as well as a half a million people right now in real time with the researchers, fighting and finding new ways how they can diagnose cardiovascular disease related risks. So the, 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 the study is called eHeart study, helping us to drive new changes within this disease domain. Another example is uh, pediatrics and the Children University Hospital here in Latvia designed a very simple solution basically to help parents whose children suffer from COVID-19 to study long COVID symptoms and to do this triage to understand who to call to the hospital because parents got worried, they were calling the hotline, whatever happens at home, they were you know, stressed, stressed a lot, you might imagine so. So basically a simple solution that we can use within you know, the bachelor thesis or any other coursework, digital surveys. Once the patient was dis discharged, they sent the, the link through SMS. People can, can hop in, fill in the diary, receive educational materials. Meanwhile, doctors can see the triage, the red flags corresponding to certain patients so they can react accordingly. And one of his examples for sure in, in, a, in a managing pandemic was the platform developed with the Boston University and the Holland Institute of Israel and our researchers in Latvia as well, how they utilize the same, the same solution to actually engage broader population in chronic condition, understanding the risk factors of chronic condition within COVID-19, and then understanding the vaccination readiness two years ago based on the risk factors to personalize the call to action, to personalize the communication with certain groups of society. Another example in public health is, once again, utilizing the day-to-day -day digital tools in women's health. So more than dozen, dozen thousands of, uh, of women in Baltics were engaged in, the, in this uh, project, which basically means that every woman hopping on the platform filled in their own personalized breast cancer risk assessment or reproductive health risk assessment test, receiving the personalized report on their mobile phone or a computer so they can use as a call to action to talk with a professional. Meanwhile, with the help of dynamic consent, they were engaged with the researchers to work hand in hand within the breast cancer research and epidemiology. Day-to-day -day examples, so virtual reality, the solution called Big Screen TV that was used to actually get your friends together and watch movies through the VR headset during pandemic, quite popular, huh? But actually this solution was used also to conduct group psychotherapy sessions because you have an avatar, you're protected, you're sitting at home, and you can open up about your stress, about any, any things happening, any roller coaster things happening during your day-to-day -day life to a professional there. Voice-based solutions, I was touch-basing in the very beginning, and I'm very, very interested in this topic, is because this is one of the most robust way how we can communicate, because you don't need to type anything, you don't need to log in to anywhere, you just talk. And some of, the, some of the examples there is for sure managing the medications like Alexa developed in the US. So once you're getting prescribed with a drug, it understands how, how many pills do you have left so it can purchase a new pack of pills to you and tell you where to go to take your prescription drugs and also notify you that you need to take your drugs on time. And another example is Children's Hospital for sure. The same diaries I was talking about in Latvia, the same one in Boston Children's Hospital was developed through the voice data. So the digital diary, calming parents, educating parents, meanwhile receiving the data by the healthcare professionals to help them to act accordingly. And it's not only about voice, it's also about the social networks, the social media that we're utilizing and using to communicate with our friends. Ask Maya in Malaysia was developed together with Bayer and researchers in, in the APEC region to actually ensure that ladies get educated and they have uh, a safe space to talk about oral contraception because of social and other stigmas that appears in, in, in the region there. Designing the smarter products, I was using this jacket not because I'm cold, actually a little bit, but uh, nevertheless it's about designing the smart apparel, the smart things that we can wear. And the product developed, the product Jaguar developed by Google and Levi's actually does the same thing. So I can touch and program my sleeve to notify, to mark what I took pills, to help me to navigate to the right department in the hospital, and sometimes it's a jungle within the large hospital so environments. So we can use such solutions to do this. So we open up the black box. What about this oversaturation with data? And it's not a secret that we generate enormous, enormous amount of data 
in a daily manner. So how can we navigate throughout these oceans of data? Because we generate a lot of noise. We cannot just put it as a huge dashboard to the healthcare professional tell, now you play Sherlock Holmes because you have only 20 minutes. Come on, you can do this. You can you know, navigate and do both jobs simultaneously. So we have the dots here. And the dots can be perceived as the data point about my heart rate, your heart rate, any other biomarkers, or as well will be touch based on your skill set, not only engineering skills, I've seen people raising their hands on the social skills, it's all represented here. So what should we do with these dots? The same thing we're having the children books with the numbers on each dot, we can interconnect them all together to receive a brighter picture, something like this. I don't think we will receive you know, Claude Monet from the, from the dots before, but nevertheless, you got the point. And it's not only for sure about the, you know, the technical skills, et cetera. It's about intercombination of different professions, different faculties, different skill sets, in order to design intuitive solutions touching the very hearts of people involved, both patients, professionals, as well as academic and industry. And this, the, this concept is developed by the MIT Health Design Thinking Lab by Bong Ku and his colleagues to actually not run and design and develop and code, and I know, you know computer science love to code, but it's actually sitting down, understanding, and looking into the day-to-day -day routine in certain departments to understand the pains, to understand the things that people are craving for, and then going back with the simple prototypes, with the day-to-day -day solutions to help them achieve that. And this job is not only about computer scientists, okay? So it's about basically building the bridge between the STEM professions, such as computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, et cetera, healthcare professionals, as well as the lawyers, designers, business, any other social science related professions. So we should build this three type of triangular bridge there to connect and to work hand in hand here. And uh, for sure, one of the things is digital skills. As an example, right now, Children's Hospital is developing this DigiHealth one-on-one concept to actually give ability to healthcare professionals, not to become the coders, but to actually extrapolate the day-to-day -day challenges towards that, hey, this guy is actually code mobile apps. It might help me to, you know, to orient my patients or to ask them some questions before or after the visit. So this type of things, once again, I'm putting it here, so interconnection of different skills is something very important. In order to fan finalize, and we have 30 seconds left, is three things that I would like to put there, and we can discuss it later on during coffee break, is always look across the fence. So I'm as a computer scientist, it's not only coding for coding purposes, it's actually understanding how I can apply my skills in different settings, like healthcare as an example. How can I help these guys working 24 seven with the solutions I can automate? Don't be only tech guided, use it as a tool. And I, I, I showed you that day-to-day -day solutions can be utilized for the help of the healthcare. And for sure as the last one, join us to drive the tech in healthcare together because healthcare is one of the most important things that we have in our lives. Thank you so much.